All right, welcome back everybody. This is part two, and this part we're going to be thinking about Karl Marx and his social theories, and also thinking about the impact that he had on the discipline of sociology. So here's Marx here, born in 1818, died in 1883, a product of the 19th century then. Uh, Karl Marx was not a sociologist. He was writing his main work slightly before the time that sociology gained uh, currency as an academic discipline. Uh, remember that sociology is really only starting to emerge in the middle of the 19th century. So we typically think of Marx more as a historian, a philosopher, a political economist, an activist, and so on. But these were all the disciplines that started to feed into the development of sociology. And Marx's ideas did have a very strong impact on the direction of sociology, just as they did on the direction of human societies. Uh, Karl Marx with Frederick Engels penned the Communist Manifesto in 1848. Um, I don't think I have to really introduce too much of Marx to you. You will be familiar with some of his ideas and certainly his role as an intellectual figure, um, in, in, um, particularly in you know, the 19th century and in the, in the 20th century as well. When I'm talking about theorists, I often like to think about what are the key questions that those theorists ask. Remember that I've said that theories are essentially answers to questions. So I like to think about what kinds of questions theorists are trying to answer. And I've said here that what are Marx's key questions? Well, the biggest one is that he's really interested in how systems of economic inequality sustain themselves over time. Marx has a very strong belief that all human societies throughout history have been marked by large-scale economic inequality, and he wants to understand why those systems of inequality perpetuate themselves, how they sustain themselves over time, despite um, many people obviously being disadvantaged by them. Marx is also interested then in how economic systems shape our experience of the world. Um, how does living in a certain economic climate change the way that we think uh, about values, about ourselves, about the kind of possibilities that are open to us. I think that's important for Marx too. Marx is also, as I said, a historian and he's interested in history. And like many theorists of the time, he wants to know, is history moving in a particular direction? Can we predict the course of history by looking back in the past and seeing how history is developing? And you'll know that Marx predicted uh, that capitalism would give way to communism because he saw it as part of a uh, development in the scope of human history that he was able to analyze uh, using the methods of his time. Uh, another important part about Marx is that Marx was also interested in the role of social science in creating change. You'll remember that figures like Comte I talked about in the last part had a very strong belief that society was beset with problems, that we could study those problems using this new science of sociology and use that knowledge to change our societies for the better. And this is something that Marx believed very strongly as well, not only of sociology, but of philosophy, of other forms of academic knowledge. He had a strong belief in the capacity and the power of that knowledge to change the world if we could just get it right. So let's think about the way that Marx answers some of these questions. And the first thing I'm thinking about is what is Marx's vision of human society? How does he think societies are organized and why does he think societies are organized in that way? The most important thing to know about Marx is that Marx, Marx thinks that societies are marked by very strong social conflict. And basically every society in human history, Marx thinks, has been divided into classes. There are different classes and typically there's one class who's able to control another class. Um, these classes have different levels of economic power and the class with economic power is able to exploit the class with lower amounts of economic power and essentially live off their labor. And Marx thinks this has been a truism throughout human history, that it doesn't matter which kind of societies we're looking at, uh, we can go right back to slave societies, say ancient Greece and ancient Rome were slave societies, and he believes those societies were marked by conflict between these classes of uh, free men and slaves. Uh, we can think about feudal societies where there was conflict between lords and serfs. Um, another aspect of Roman society was the conflict between the patricians and the plebeians. So Marx sees throughout human history that in all human societies there are conflict between various groups of people uh, who are segmented by the fact that they have different levels of economic power. And so Marx carries forward this analysis of history. He says we've gone from slaves and slaveholders, lords and serfs, and now we still have two major classes. And for Marx, these are what he called the working class, or the proletariat was his term. 
um, and the property owning class, or what he called the bourgeoisie. So there's some French terminology for you to know there. The working class, the proletariat, and the property owning class, the bourgeoisie. And it was Marx's fundamental belief that in modern society, there were those who owned property, and particularly who owned capital. Those who owned the factories, those who owned the machines, and so on. And those were the bourgeoisie. And then you have the working class, the working class who essentially own nothing, and they have to sell their labor for a wage to the bourgeoisie in order to survive. Okay, so the working class are not those who own the factories, they go to work for those who own the factories. And Marx thinks the dynamic between these two classes really tells us everything about what's going on in certainly contemporary modern societies, that is, industrial capitalist societies. So Marx is primarily known as an analyst of contemporary capitalism. And again, he sees capitalism as a constant struggle between the proletariat, that is, the working class, and the bourgeoisie. Okay, the owning class. And what are they struggling over? Well, Marx thinks that all classes throughout history have been struggling over what he calls surplus value. Okay. Marx fundamentally believes that the oppressed classes, whether they are slaves, serfs, or modern workers, uh, these are the classes that create all the value. Okay, they do everything. They produce everything. Everything that we have comes from these classes. Uh, but they don't receive all the benefits of producing those particular things. Rather, the classes above them exploit them. They skim off the cream, if you will. They live off the labor of these lower classes. Okay, And in industrial capitalist societies, Marx talks particularly about this idea of surplus value. Um, surplus value here being the difference between what costs to produce a good and then what that good is actually sold for in the marketplace. So there are certain costs of production, um, you know, it costs a certain amount to pay for workers to produce things. But then when we sell a good, there's typically a profit. And that for Marx is the surplus value. And what Marx is interested in is who gets that surplus value? Why does that surplus value go to the bourgeoisie or to the owners and not to the workers? And Marx sees a constant conflict in societies going on between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie over this surplus value. The proletariat is often fighting to get some of that surplus value back to them in the form of higher wages, perhaps better conditions, and so on, whereas the bourgeoisie wants to take that extra surplus value. They want to keep it for themselves as profit and wealth. And Marx's belief is that the bourgeoisie class, like all the exploitative classes throughout history, are able to extract surplus value from the lower classes and live off the labor of others and live quite well, I should say, off the labor of others. So Marx sees the same dynamic happening in where, whether it's slaves and slaveholders in ancient Greece, lords and serfs in medieval Europe, or proletariat and bourgeoisie in modern society. It's always the same dynamic. An upper class who sucks up the wealth, who lives off the labor of others, and a lower class who is exploited by them. Marx then believes that this causes that lower class to live in conditions of exploitation and alienation. They are exploited because they produce everything. They produce all the wealth, according to Marx at least, whereas the property owners essentially do nothing and they take that extra wealth from the proletariat rather than the proletariat giving, uh, having that wealth for themselves, say in the form of higher wages. Marx's fundamental idea is that with a communist society, the workers will seize the means of production from the bourgeoisie. They will seize control of, say, the factories, machines, and so on, and then they will be able to enjoy the full results of their labor rather than having this, what Marx would think of as an essentially parasitic class, sucking up all the wealth from them. I've also used the term alienation here, which is a very important idea for Marx and for Marxists. Um, there's been a complicated history of studying, theorizing about alienation. But Marx essentially believes that the modern worker is strongly alienated from the products they produce. They work in a very strong division of labor. Rather than, like a craftsman, you know, producing all of a product, they might just produce a particular little small part of the product in, say, a factory or on an assembly line. And so they never really get to see the full results of their labor. And immediately after they produce something, it's taken by the bourgeoisie and then marketed, taken by the owners and then marketed. So the worker does not have full control over the things that they produce. And for Marx, this creates a situation of alienation, where the individual is working but never enjoying the actual fruits of work and labor. 
And for Marx, this is a very strong kind of negative emotional condition that can motivate pressure for social change. That's really Marx's answer to the question of how societies are organised. Okay, you think societies are organised in groups of classes where certain classes dominate others. The question is then, why does everyone go along with this? Marx thinks throughout human history, this has been the fundamental structure of societies, one class dominating another. So why is it that we go along with this? Or why is it that the oppressed classes go along with this, I should say? Uh, Marx here tries to develop syst uh, theories about social action. Remember I said theories about social action are theories about why people behave the way they do. And here the question is why people go along with this? Why isn't there constant revolutions and revolt and why don't the working class overthrow the bourgeoisie in modern societies? Well, Marx's fundamental belief is that the, uh, the classes who are on top of the hierarchies, for one thing, they have physical force on their side. Um, so they can typically use systems of force and domination to dominate those in lower classes. But Marx thinks that if a system only rests on force and violence, it's probably not going to be all that stable. And so he develops ideas here about uh, what he calls ideology. And I'm sure you all heard the time, term ideology. It's a relatively common term in popular discourse now. But Marx's fundamental idea is that systems of thought, systems of ideas are developed to essentially trick those in the lower classes into believing that that's where they are meant to be. That's where they deserve to be, and perhaps even that it's good for them to be where they are. Um, there's an interesting idea that Marx develops here, and it, it's a model of society which is called the base and superstructure model. So Marx argues that we can think of societies as having this very strong economic base. So every society has uh, what he calls an economic base, and economic bases are relationships of production, distribution, and exchange. So every society depends on this fundamental economic organization, um, whether it's a, a society, a feudal society, a slave society, a modern capitalist society. Uh, we need factories, we need tools, we need machines, we need people to work them. And what Marx wants to understand is how does that base create uh, what he calls the superstructure? And the superstructure is all the things in society which aren't the economic base, um, particularly the society's values, perhaps its political systems, the kind of art and media it produces, the culture that it has, um, all the morality of that society is part of the superstructure. And Marx's idea is that whatever's going on at the base is reflected at the level of the superstructure. The economic base is what shapes the superstructure. Okay? So economics for Marx always determines the shape of culture in a society. And Marx's idea is that societies develop forms of culture that legitimize the relationships at its economic base. An example of this, I talked very briefly before about the theories of Aristotle, where Ar Aristotle, writing in ancient Greece, is writing in a slave society, a society divided between free men and slaves. And if you read Aristotle's political philosophy, he spends a great deal of that political philosophy trying to justify why slavery is an acceptable system and why people should be organized into slaves and free men. Aristotle, of course, being a free man. Um, and so Marx's idea would be, here's an example of where the philosophy of the society reflects its economic base. Everything that's going on at the level of ideas, culture, governance, and so on for Marx is really there just to justify the economic relations of that particular society. And so Marx was very critical of many of the elements of modern societies, liberal democracy, ideas about um, justice and freedom and so on. He thought that a lot of those values simply existed to justify the oppression of workers. Um, workers were brainwashed, they were tricked by the superstructure of a society into supporting things which fundamentally went against the workers' own interest. And this is Marx's explanation as to why people go along with forms of inequality in the world, because essentially they are tricked by ideology. Um, they are tricked by the impact of the superstructure, which is there to justify what's going on at the base. You'll remember Marx is famous, or maybe you don't remember, but maybe you know Marx's famous line that religion is the opiate of the masses. Um, so Marx thinks that religion, religious norms, religious practices, really also exist to justify the relationships of economic domination that are happening in the society. And Marx thinks this was true in feudal societies, and it continues to be true today, that religions encourage uh, the conformity of workers, and they encourage them not to challenge 
these systems of power and inequality around them. So I've talked a little bit about Marx's theory of social order and Marx's theory of social action as well. Let's also think about Marx's theory of social change. Um, when I introduced Marx, I said that one interesting thing about Marx is that he really believed he could discern the general pattern of history, that he could look back in the past and see a pattern, a regular um, set of occurrences in human societies, that all societies seem to have these different classes, and he believed that eventually those classes would fight one another, they would come to conflict, and either that would lead to the ruin of both classes and the emergence of a new social order, or one class taking power from another class, and again, building a new kind of social order. And for Marx, this has happened to every kind of major economic organization throughout history. If we look at slave societies, eventually there were revolts of the slaves, um, new political demands on the basis of slaves and so on. This led to the decline of slave societies and the emergence of feudal societies in some areas. I mean, feudal societies, you have this constant conflict between lords and serfs and all these middle classes as well who are jockeying for power. And eventually feudalism breaks down from this conflict and we move on to capitalism. And Marx naturally then thinks the same thing is going to happen to capitalism. Um, what's interesting here is that Marx thinks that social change is almost inevitable. He believes that there, is, there are contradictions in all forms of economic systems where the interests of different classes cannot be reconciled. There is no harmony available between these two classes. Class relationships can be uh, smoothed over for a time, but fundamentally, the worker wants uh, higher wages, the capitalist wants to pay them less wages, and inevitably they're going to come into conflict and it's going to lead to a new kind of social system. For Marx, that new kind of social system after capitalism would be a socialist or communist society, again, where the proletarians would overthrow the bourgeoisie, they would take control over um, human societies, over, economic, uh, over the economic base, and then over the surplus value, and they would be able to end exploitation and alienation via that process. That was Marx's general idea. That was his philosophy of history, that history was moving in a progressive direction towards lower and lower degrees of oppression, where finally all forms of exploitation and alienation would be ended in this utopian communist or socialist society. It's really important to stress here that Marx thought this was inevitable. It wasn't a matter of people just how, you know, there might be social conflict and maybe in, there'll be an opportunity for the proletarians to rise up. Marx had a very strong belief that social change was inevitable because of contradictions in capitalism. So one thing that Marx thought, for example, is that over time, capitalists would start to make less and less profit um, because they would reduce the the amount of workers they had and replace them by machines. There would be more automation. Um, uh, you know, instead of having workers in factories doing things, you'd have machines in factories doing things. Well, Marx believes that workers are the source of all value. And if you get rid of the workers, you actually won't have as much surplus value as you had in the past. So Marx developed a theory that eventually the rates of profit in capitalist firms would fall. And that what that would lead to is the overall collapse of the economic system. Same thing with his idea that capitalists would always want to pay workers uh, the least amount possible. But of course, if they do that, then the workers don't have much money to spend on the products that the capitalist makes. So these, for Marx, are all contradictions of capitalism, which would eventually lead to a new social system as an inevitability, because it could not sustain itself with this level of contradiction and this level of conflict between various classes. So that is my explanation of some of the key ideas of Marxist thought for you. Um, of course, there has been an, an intense amount of social debate, let's say, about whether Marx was right, where he was right, uh, what, which of these ideas are relevant and not. Many economists have critiqued a lot of Marx's ideas. Many social theorists have critiqued Marx's ideas. But let's think about some of the patterns of Marxist thought that became very influential on sociology as a discipline. And I've listed some of them here. The first one is a very strong belief that social theories, the purpose of them is not just to analyze what's going on in the world, but to try and change the world. And this is something which has been very influential on sociologists throughout history. So you'll see many sociologists today arguing that as sociologists, we should not try to be neutral, detached, unbiased observers of social oppression or marginalization. That it's our role as sociologists to try and help those 
um, you know, who are in these oppressed positions through the results of sociological study. And there are many influential currents of sociological thought today which maintain that commitment to a very politically committed form of sociology. Another thing we get from Marx that has been influential is a belief in the primacy of economic factors. So not all sociologists agree with this, and you'll see that someone like Weber is strongly critical of this idea, but Marx fundamentally believes that economics determine everything else. Remember that base superstructure model. The idea is that whatever values a society has, whatever forms of governance it has, whatever relationships between people, all of this is done on the basis of what's going on at the level of economics. Um, this is often called a materialist philosophy. That is, the material things, the economics, the production, the exchange, the distribution of goods, that's where all social change comes from. That's what determines all social action. Okay? So Marx has this very, very strong belief that if you want to know what's going on in society, always the first thing you should look at is what's going on at the level of the economy. Um, Marx also gives us some key interests. So Marx had a very strong interest in how certain groups maintain power over others. And particularly this idea of ideology becomes very common for future sociologists. There are now multiple generations of Marxist theorists trying to understand the nature of ideology. How does one group promote values, ideas and beliefs which help to maintain them in systems of power? And that idea has now been extended outside of just, say, the class analysis of Marx and is being used, for example, by feminist theorists who want to understand how are there ideas in society which help to justify and legitimize the system of male power. Um, and there are many other kinds of theorists who are doing that work in other fields as well, whether it's about racial conflict, um, conflict between people of different sexualities, things like that, which I'll talk about in the last part of this lecture. One final thing we get from Marx, which is important, is what's called this structuralism. Um, structuralism is a term for theories in sociology which believe that individual behavior is very strongly determined by social structure. So often we talk in sociology about agency on the one hand, structure on the other. Agency is our free will, it's our capacity to act from our own volition. Structure is social structure and the influence that social structure has over our behavior. And some theorists think we have a lot more free will. Other theorists think, no, we're very much determined by society. We are kind of puppets or pawns of the society. We have very little control over our history, our behavior, and really we are strongly determined by what's going on in society. And Marx would be an example of this second kind of thinker, a very strong structuralist thinker. Okay. Again, Marx thinks that history is determined by these inevitable laws. He thinks that our behavior is determined by all this kind of ideology with which we've been brainwashed. So Marx sees very little room for the individual to act. There's a very strong sense in Marx that the individual is determined by the society around them. And these kind of ideas have been influential on sociology. They've also been very popular in sociology. Um, naturally, sociologists are attracted to theories which try to say that studying society is very important because society is a very strong influence on human behavior. And you'll see this is a common theme in many of these classical theorists, and it's a common theme running throughout many of the theorists you'll come across in this course. All right, that's the end of our part on Marx. Let's come back and we'll talk about two other classical theorists and their divergences with Marx, and that's Max Weber and Emile Durkheim. <laughs>